Welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight we're going to discuss and celebrate an important victory. The Oklahoma English Only Initiative, discussed on three previous WordPath shows, has been defeated in the courts. Rah. Now, here to discuss this event with us are Fanny Bates of Norman, um, Fanny's attorney in the case, um, John Paris, he's sitting on the end, and Judy Baker of Oklahoma City, who is Chickasaw. And Fanny, I believe you're Cherokee, correct? Your heritage. Excellent. So I want to welcome you all. Uh, thank you all for making the trip to Norman, uh, not County Fanny, who was here. Before we start our discussion, since some people may not be familiar, I want to give a little background and, and history on the English-only situation here. Um, first of all, there have been a number of English-only bills and initiatives across the United States. They've passed in, I'm not sure the exact number, but certainly over 20 states. There was an attempt to pass English-only legislation in Oklahoma through the legislature rather than an initiative process in the 1980s, which failed, fortunately. Um, and then in 2000, an Oklahoma initiative petition drive funded by a national organization called U.S. English um, was held to get state question 689 on the ballot, loosely called the English Only Initiative. Uh, this U.S. English organization claims 15,000 members in Oklahoma and 1.4 million across the United States. So they're a very large, well-founded organization. Basically, the measure would make English the official language of Oklahoma and outlaw the spending of any state money to publish or provide services in any language other than English. Exceptions were to be made for the teaching of foreign languages in the schools. And it also allowed for, but did not require, uh, that any money already committed to publications and services in other languages be um, rerouted to English as a second language classes. Over 100,000 signatures uh, were collected well over the sufficient number if all of them were valid. The actual required number, I think, was 60-some thousand. Um, uh, but first, before uh, the initiative could be placed on the ballot, uh, there was a 10-day period during which citizens could protest the initiative to the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And 11 people, including myself and Fanny Bates, uh, wrote letters of protest and became involved in this court case having to do with the English-only initiative. Some of us had attorneys and John Paris was uh, Fanny's, uh, and some did not. I didn't, for instance. Um, there was a hearing, and then numerous briefs were submitted. I'm going to show you <laughs> what happens when you get involved in a case like this. This was over a period of some months, but you know there was, there was a stretch there where every day I'd go to my mailbox, and there'd be about half a pound of stuff waiting for me, it seemed like. Um, there's a lot of reading involved in something like this. Uh, every paper that's submitted has to be, copies have to be submitted to everyone else involved in the case. So it was quite an educational experience. Um, so numerous uh, briefs were submitted. Uh, Senator Carol Martin, um, who was uh, one of two original sponsors of the initiative, and as I understand it, the only one who really stuck with it, um, and her attorney from a, a, a firm called Patton Boggs in Washington, D.C., and of course the people who signed this petition were basically on one side of the issue. On the other side were a great collection of native, Hispanic, and other letter writers, the 11 letter writers I mentioned, also the Intertribal Word Path Society, the Green Party of Oklahoma, the ACLU, the Latino Community Development Agency of Oklahoma City, Coalition of Hispanic Organizations of Tulsa, some newspapers like the Duncan Banner and the Norman Transcript editorialized against it, Governor Keating was against it, the Linguistic Society of America, and every Teaching English as a Second Language organization that I've ever heard of is always against this sort of initiative. Um, and so that was kind of uh, the lineup. We were, the, all that long list was opposed to it, and basically Senator Martin and the people who signed the petition were for it. There was a challenge by Fanny Bates also to the validity of the signatures. If, those, if half of those 100,000 signatures had not been valid, of course, uh, we wouldn't have had to worry about challenging the content. Uh, that signature challenge was later abandoned, and we'll probably talk about that briefly later. So basically that left us 11 and all other interested parties just sort of waiting for the court to decide, which took quite some time, uh, basically to decide the issue based on the content of the initiative itself. Finally, on April 2nd of this year, we got the word. State question 689 would not be on the ballot. So sorry to take so long with my introduction, but I wanted to make sure everybody had adequate background to know exactly what we're talking about and what a long, hard-fought victory this is. And now you all are going to tell us a lot of the reasons why it is important and how you were involved and why and so forth. Let me start with you, Fanny. How did you get involved 
and why were you opposed to state question 689 in the first place? Well, I was living in Edmond when this all started, and I went to the post office to mail a letter one day, and there was a woman standing out in front of the post office with a Jesus t-shirt on, and she was trying to get people to sign this petition mm -hmm. saying that she wanted English to be the official language of the state of Oklahoma, and I was just horrified. I said, do you think Jesus spoke English? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> She just looked at me, but I went straight to uh, the computer and looked it up and uh, figured out what was going on. And mm. then it was just a short time later when the announcement came out that the Supreme Court was going to be hearing this and people mm. had a chance to object. And I didn't know that we were going to exp be expected to actually participate in the suit. I, I just didn't was writing yeah. a letter to the right. Supreme Court because exactly. they asked if anyone objected, so I objected. Right. And then I got a letter back saying, you're expected to participate in this right. court case. Right. Same with me. Uh, uh, Judy Baker, how about you? How did you first get involved and why is it important to you? Well, uh, Fanny notified Roosevelt Milton, who's the president of the NAACP here in Oklahoma. I happened to work with Mr. Melton, and he knew that at the time I was a member of the board of the local Chickasaw Tribal Council, and he knew that I had um, an interest and um, spent a great deal of time following um, news items and things that uh, had to do with the rights of Native Americans. Right. So he uh, brought this to my attention after she contacted him. And uh, I got in, con in touch with Fanny, and uh, I think I was just a little bit late getting involved, named as a party, but mm -hmm. went to the hearings and things like that. But you were involved in, uh, uh, well, we'll talk a little bit more later about how exactly right. you were involved, <laughs> but you were certainly an interested party, shall oh, yes. we say. Um, I, d I really uh, was trying to get a brief introduction here, but let me give you both just another minute to talk about why, based on the content of the English only idea, why were you opposed to English only? Okay? Well, this particular law, now each English, English only law across the states, they're different from state to state, but ours would have been one of the worst ones in the whole country because it said you couldn't spend a penny of city, county, or state money on any language other than English. For example, if a battered women's shelter was getting um, county funding, then they would have been afraid to put out pamphlets in Cherokee or Choctaw mm -hmm. or Vietnamese or Spanish right. because they could lose their funding. So people who did not speak English would not know that that service was available. Right. Judy, you want to say any more along those lines? about? What um, bugged you most about English only? <laughs> well, um, I think that it was, I, I honestly could not believe that it was something that came up, um, <laughs> being that um, we are in the heartland and um, this is Native America being in Oklahoma. Right. Um, we also have a number of different other minorities and, and other languages that are spoken. I right. work in social services, so it affected me as a Native American as it also uh, professionally. I was very right. concerned. Right. Well, let's go to John Paris now. John, how did you first get involved and what, how do you feel about the whole thing briefly? <laughs> well, I, I didn't get a chance to uh, think about the, the good or bad of the petition. Uh, Fanny got in touch with uh, our principal chief, Chad Smith, and asked for some assistance. And uh, Chad called me and, and delegated that uh, duty to myself. Right. I don't know if I made clear that you work for Cherokee Nation as yes. an attorney. Yes, right. I'm yeah, staff I'm attorney with Cher Cherokee Nation. Right. And, and uh, Chad Smith is my ultimate boss. Right. And so he, when he tells me to go to Oklahoma City and help Fanny Bates out, I, I went. <laughs> and so we, uh, we spent a few days photocopying all the signatures in preparation for the signature challenge that I guess we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, then when it came to having to prepare a brief and legal arguments why it's legally uh, unconstitutional, then uh, I was able to assist Fanny in that also. Right. Maybe we could talk just briefly about that signature challenge. Um, Fanny, you want to kind of introduce that? Or I guess uh, you were involved in that also, Judy, right? Right, I'll let's, let Fanny. Let's let both of you uh, just describe that a little bit and maybe yeah. explain why it got dropped. Well, it was a huge undertaking. Um, 
we had to check each one of those signatures and there were like a hundred thousand of them mm -hmm. and there were a lot of things you had to check whether or not the person was who they said they were whether or not they're a registered mm -hmm. voter and whether or not the person who uh, was going around and passing out the things and getting them to sign it was a resident of the state of Oklahoma. Right. These uh, people were using people from other states mm. to do this and they were using children to do it. Mm. And it's illegal in Oklahoma. Uh, that's one way that our law is very good and that's one thing that people in other states can do to, d can do to protect themselves from this kind of thing mm -hmm. is set up their law like ours is. You have to be an adult and you have to be eligible to be a voting citizen of this state right. before you can go around passing around an initiative petition and get it uh, and have it validated. So um, uh, we were having to investigate all those and it was a huge job, but that was one of the reasons I think that they just decided to give up because it wasn't worth as much to them as it was to us. Mm -hmm. This was important to us and there were thousands of people in the state of Oklahoma that thought this was worth fighting for and we were willing to do whatever it took, and they weren't willing to. They were right. willing to do it if it didn't cost them more than $150,000. Right. But yeah, just the hearing for that part would have taken a month. Right. Now, I didn't make it clear in my little thumbnail introduction that actually the uh, proponents of the measure tr did try to back out. They oh, tried to back out and we wouldn't let them leave. We and wanted them to stay here we so we could. And the court wouldn't <laughs> let them back out, which I'm sure was kind of awkward for them. But <laughs> Judy, tell us more about just, I know it, it had to get dropped, the. Uh, the signature challenge, but I just, I never was able to come up and help you, Fanny. I kept meaning to go up there. I, I understand you were actually standing in the hallways in the Capitol. What was, what was that scene like? And did you actually we were, call a, a yes. copy machine there and everything? Well, I, I don't even remember where the copy machine came from. I brought it. Oh, you brought it? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, because right, we loaded it up. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, um, standing in the hall down in the basement of the oh, Capitol gosh. building, um, copying page after page, page, after page of signatures uh, so that we could check those because we couldn't remove those from and mm -hmm. so it was a matter of going in and checking those out and making the copies and putting them all back together just right and now it wasn't just you two like verifying things was it or I mean did you, I hope you had an, a vol an army of volunteers helping you out with this I don't know about an army, but there were several other people. Yeah. I can see how it could rapidly become overwhelming, though, and I'm actually glad that it came to be decided on the merits of the content. I think it's, uh, we'll, we'll go to you next, John, and talk about the content, uh, but I assume that it's kind of um, from the precedent-setting point of view and from the satisfaction point of view on our side, I think, too, it's, it's good to have the court have come down and say, you know, the content of this is not all right, so I'm kind of glad it is that it did end up being decided that way. Can yeah. you summarize some of the reasons for the court's decision for us, John? Well, the, when, they, uh, when we dropped the signature challenge, I, I guess let me back up and say there's three ways to defeat a, an initiative petition, mm -hmm. and uh, at least three ways. And mm -hmm. Primarily, one is to invalidate the signatures. And uh, for those of us, other people in Oklahoma, they remember the cockfighting petition. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a massive effort to defeat that on the signatures, right. and uh, and we realized I'm a friend of the attorney that worked on that, and I found out how much effort was involved in inv invalidating those signatures, <laughs> and we realized that was a uh, that was a hill we weren't prepared to climb, and and we felt on strong enough grounds that this act was unconstitutional anyway. Right. So the second way is to get it declared unconstitutional, and if you if you fail in that regard, you still it just goes to a vote of the people, and and this, there's a statewide vote so you have another chance to defeat it. Fortunately we were able to defeat it in the Supreme Court because uh, Oklahoma is a little bit unusual in that our Supreme Court will look at initiative petitions before they go to the voters and decide whether they're constitutional or not. Mm -hmm. And that's most states <coughs> uh, require an act to be put into law and then somebody challenge it. Mm -hmm. I believe that's how it happened in Arizona mm -hmm. was that it was actually uh, voted on by the people and placed in law and then the Supreme Court of Arizona came back after, after it was challenged and, and declared the Arizona statute unconstitutional. So there actually is a legal viewpoint that says, no, you, it's, you ought, it, it's perfectly fine. You ought to be able to put unconstitutional things on the ballot and have the people vote them right. up or down. And 
Well, th that's um, that's the majority of states' view. Strikes me as kind of odd, but <laughs> right. uh, I'm glad we had this opportunity to sort of nip it in the bud before it became a you know who can spend the most money mm -hmm. on the TV ads kind of issue. Right. So it, the Oklahoma Supreme Court feels like it, if it's unconstitutional on its face or as it reads right now that right. there's no way this law will be uh, valid, then let's let's go ahead and strike it down now before we go through a full election and, and somebody has to bring a lawsuit right. after it's passed in law. And which, which in the long run is a much more expensive Much more expensive, through. much more trouble when when the court can see uh, today that, that it was unconstitutional and save all that time. Right. So uh, the, uh, the, the Supreme Court counted up and found 22 other states that have English only laws. Uh, and uh, Oklahoma and Arizona are two others that tried to pass them. Okay, those The other 22, it's a symbolic act. And, and I, it's symbolic, uh, similar to the state bird or the state flower. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, so here's the state official state language. And it really doesn't mean anything. You know, right. can uh, if another bird flies in the state, it doesn't break any law. Right. Uh, but in, and so, so in those states, if you use another language, it doesn't break any law. It's just a symbolic act. Right. And those have been found constitutional because they really don't do anybody harm, mm -hmm. uh, other than morally, perhaps, but, but not legally. Yeah. Uh, it's and it may be silly, and you might ought to vote those people out of office, but it's not unconstitutional. Right. So, the Arizona law was fairly restrictive. It it made some some real limits on the state employees and people what they could and could not do, mm -hmm. unlike the symbolic acts. The Oklahoma law was even more restrictive than Arizona's. Uh, Arizona had some uh, exemptions that they thought would save it uh, for public health and safety, and a couple other exemptions. Uh, the Oklahoma Act had very few exemptions, mm -hmm. and I'll talk about those in a minute. But the the uh, another difference is that the Oklahoma Constitution is a good bit more protective of free speech uh, than most than the U.S. Constitution and many other states' constitutions, and that uh, that was something that was uh, that was uh, brought out clearly, and the and the court decided it based on the Oklahoma Constitution. So whether this case will apply, it, this case won't apply directly in very many other states because every state has their different constitutions. And, and some states are, are uh, not, not as strong on free speech as the Oklahoma Constitution is. So, so anyway, the, the, uh, the Section B of the Act it violated the, the free speech uh, in the Oklahoma Constitution. The, the court didn't need to go to the federal constitution or federal laws in order to strike this down. They, they looked at it, compared it to Oklahoma Constitution first, and struck it down. It violates the, the restricts the speech mainly with the government because it, it forbids, as Fannie mentioned, it forbids government employees from using any other language but English. Right. And, and that, uh, that inhibits the speech of the government employee and the person that needs to speak to that government uh, agent. And so that, that the court found that, that was very unconstitutional. They, uh, the court said, real briefly, they said it's fraught with infirmities. Number one is that constitutional free speech item. They, in, a, in a very good quote I'd like to read from that, mm -hmm. they, said, they said, there should be no potential interference with a meaningful dialogue of ideas concerning self-government, nor should there be a threat uh, to, the, to the expression of those ideas. And so this, this is an interference with the, the speech. Uh, which language you choose is an interference with the speech of people. And, uh, and, and partly the next reason that they uh, struck it down is, is it's, even if it wasn't a, a real interference, and I'll talk about that in a minute, it was a potential threat. And, and the potential threat was because in the act, the, the very last uh, paragraph of the act tries to save the act. It says the provisions of this shall not be construed to violate uh, or limit your ability to speak under the U.S. Constitution or the Oklahoma Constitution. Right. Well, that, that exception or that catch-all doesn't save it. Uh, they should have simply made it a symbolic, had they just made it a symbolic act, then it wouldn't uh, affect your right to speak anyway, because the Oklahoma Constitution and the federal Constitution guarantee our right to speak, uh, particularly to government. And so when that, uh, that uh, exception clause, uh, it, what we say is it shifts the, the burden of who knows what's right and wrong. Uh, it says everything's, everything is illegal except what's allowed in the Constitution. Mm. 
well, the Constitution allows everything, you know, nearly everything. And so instead of the, the government having to tell you that you're calling fire in a, fire ha in a theater is, is an illegal free speech, you can't, or obscenity, or mm -hmm. things, there are some limits on free speech. Mm -hmm. And so if you cross those limits, the government will uh, arrest you or, or mm -hmm. put you in jail or tell you you can't say that. In this case, they say, you can't, uh, you have to figure out in advance what's legal or not. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we, we will arrest you and then you have to prove that it's legal under the Constitution. Uh, so so that's, that's seen as a, just being unfair on the everyday That's unfair, citizen. right. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, uh, it, in, that, in various statutes have, uh, have tried to do that in the past and it, it, in different ways, any, any kind of act that says everything's ex illegal except what's allowed uh, and it puts the burden on the people to uh, to know what that does is is that most of us aren't constitutional law scholars. Uh, very few people can tell you what's legal to say or not, and they they said, and that's the chilling effect is what the U.S. Supreme Court uses is you think, well, I don't know if it's legal or not, and so I won't use that speech. And so you just, just out of conservativeness, you don't want to right. go out and get arrested. Most of us don't, right. just to test it out, see. And so that, there was, there was a third, uh, more minor point. The, the act was uh, very poorly drafted, in my opinion. But one, uh, one point that they made was that the, this one exception they made was that you could use it for education, or you could use money for education uh, according to procedures um, to the provisions of the Administrative Procedures Act to promote the following principles. And then there's no principles listed in the act. <laughs> I thought that was it, pretty odd, too. Right. It, every, <laughs> it seems the, like kind of a rush, rush the, job. Of the drafting. first time you read it, you think there's something wrong with this act because right. they say the following principles, and then it goes on to different provisions. Right. And so the Oklahoma Supreme Court said uh, not only is that bad drafting, but that's uh, uh, unconstitutional delegation of power. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the legislature has to give sufficient guidance to an administrative agency like the uh, Board of Head, uh, the education department in order to know what rules should we write and, and a, an administrative body like the Department of Education can't have free reign to write their own policies. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the legislature has to give a minimal uh, mm -hmm. certain amount of direction because uh, it's, it's the legislature that sets policy, it's the administrators that carry out that policy. And while administrators can write some detailed, you know, some minor procedural rules, they have to have a policy to follow from the legislature. Mm -hmm. So those were the three reasons that the Supreme Court struck it down. Uh, okay. Well, uh, Fanny and Judy, um, tell us a little bit about how you felt when you got the news, <laughs> the good news that it's, had been defeated in the courts. Um, I, I had this sense of uh, it's about time, yeah. and um, I was really glad that um, to be involved with all of it. Um, yeah. I was just elated. Yeah. yeah. It's Me wonderful. Too. And it does kind of make you feel good, kind of proud to have gone to the trouble to write that letter or get involved or get that paper and run that Xerox machine or, you know, whatever role you played in it because there weren't that many individuals, you know, kind of fighting on our side. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in a way, if you count all those signatures, it was, you know, a couple of dozen of us against the 100,000, <laughs> if you look at it that way. Um, and so it does feel good. I want end. the whole world to know that Oklahoma beat U.S. English right. Inc. Right. Because it they haven't be been done. beaten very many times. That's and right. they're very powerful and they mislead people. Right. And just like in Oklahoma, they went around telling people that this didn't affect Indians. Right. Because they said, oh, well, Indians can still speak their language on their reservation. Yeah. Well, we don't have very many These reservations don't in even Oklahoma. know about the reservation situation in Oklahoma. <laughs> right. Right, I know. It really. Uh, they, they, I, I kept getting that sense in several places that they were just, they were just, the proponents would just sort of say, "Oh, don't worry about the Indian language thing, or don't worry about deaf people, or don't worry about this. That's all taken care of. That's not in this." And they just wanted us to believe that, take their word for it, you know. Well, that, that's the vagueness that the court objected to, right. because the the little paragraph, you know. We don't want to violate the U.S. Constitution. Right. Well, who knows what like that's what violates it, you know? And so everybody's right. chilled. What do you think the prospects are for the future, John, just from the legal point? Uh, 
do you think they're likely to come back soon or not so likely because of the way it was defeated here? Uh, the the court left plenty of room, and they 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 said definitely they're not they're, they explicitly said we're not deciding whether some English only statute might pass, and, and they they hinted that the uh, symbolic type acts uh, may pass muster because they they don't they don't really restrict anybody's free anybody's speech. Uh, they say this is the official language, but you know, they could make the official dog, but I can have a, my pet dog can be a different kind of dog. Right. And right. just because English is official language, you can still speak yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so in a, in a symbolic act may well pass, and that's what uh, U.S. English Inc. has passed in 22 other states apparently. Yeah. And so that whether that comes back or not, hopefully the, uh, the political climate has changed uh, some and... and um, uh, whether they come back or not, I don't. I don't know. They, okay. Anybody? We've only got one minute left. Anybody want the last word on? If they ever do come back, how I are we going to treat them? What are we going <laughs> to? We're going to beat them again. <laughs> more, definitely more awareness and uh, yes, yeah. defeat again. For now, at least, I want to end with this little gesture. For now, English only in Oklahoma is right here in the circular file, and we hope it stays there for a long, long time. That's right. <laughs> right? That's right. Okay, well, I want to thank you all for coming. I know, John, you especially had a long trip down from Tahlequah, and uh, Judy came from Oklahoma City, and um, Fanny, you've been faithful as, all, as always fighting this fight, and I know if they come back, you know, we'll all be involved again. And uh, I'm just so happy and so proud of our court and our state. And I want to thank you all for joining me tonight, and I'll see you next time on WordPath. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma wana kita, wa pene ma na oni.